everybody and welcome. It's nice to see such a great crowd here tonight. I'd like to call the meeting to order and I'm going to start off with the flag salute. We'll all stand, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And then please remain standing and we're going to sing America the Beautiful. Edna. Send it around because maybe you'd like to look at it further. 
And along with that, I'll send a piece of paper and a pencil if you'd like to reserve one. Okay, thank you very much, Sola. Is there any, is there any old business? Under new business, our next meeting is December 3rd, and it's our annual Christmas with the Masons, something that we always look forward to. The gift of the month is uh, actually up over our heads. It's, the, it's a uh, 1993 gateway computer, keyboard and monitor from Richard and Francis Bernier, which gives the office another word processor to use along with their regular computer. Another office announcement, or society announcement, is that Randy Bennett's title is now Assistant Director as well as Curator of Collections. So the Secretary's report about what the Curator did was right for last meeting, but uh, whatever he does from here on in, uh, he'll have an additional title as well. Congratulations, Randy. The official name of our new house next door is the Robinson House. Uh, some of you may remember that it was thought to be uh, more correctly named the Foster Straw House, but research into uh, what burned and what didn't, I guess, at a certain point in time revealed that uh, something had not really burned that we thought had burned, and the uh, Robinson House is the uh, really the correct name. So you'll hear us talking about the Robinson House. It's still the uh, same building. It's a more uh, historically correct name. And that was uh, voted on, as well as the fact that our, our name of the whole center will now be the Regional History Center. It's just a shortened version of what we had called the Center for Local and Regional History that you, I'm sure you have in some of your literature. To uh, let it roll off our lips a little easier, among other things, it's now the <coughs> Regional History Center. Don't forget the uh, quilt raffle. The uh, <coughs> raffle tickets are up here, a picture of the quilt. I guess the quilt itself is not... It's in the closet right now. It's in the, the closet right, right now. Right but there's a picture of it right here. A picture of it here. We have a uh, fax now upstairs, courtesy of life members John and Julia Fox of West Newton, Massachusetts in Andover, Maine. And uh, you won't remember it, I'm sure, at least I won't, but the number is, are we going to publish it? When are we going to? 824-0882 is our fax number. Uh, the genealogy committee is looking for new members. And in case anybody's interested, which I hope some of you will be, the meeting, next meeting will be November 17th, I guess here, uh, is it? Uh, right, upstairs. At uh, 7 p.m. And now a pretty big announcement, which some of you may have caught wind of already. Uh, there's going to be a tremendous New Year's Eve type celebration that the Historical Society is spearheading. And uh, with lots of help from the Chamber of Commerce, the Mahusic Arts Council, and other community people. And it's going to uh, last from about 6 till 12.30. There's going to be eight different performances at four different locations. Uh, bands, music, a humorist. There'll be a lighted Jeep parade at the beginning. There'll be a bonfire, I guess, most of the way through. There'll be fireworks at midnight. And uh, all kinds of interesting stuff geared toward family fun. Uh, it's a non-alcoholic type family fun type evening. If you want to uh, booze it up, you've got to go someplace else. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a lot of interest in a lot of the local groups around town in a uh, family-oriented, non-alcoholic fun entertainment type thing. People would go from one location to another. Each of the four locations has two different performances that alternate back and forth, I guess about three quarters of an hour each, one and then the other. So with a gap in between to go to some other location if you want. 
So keep your eyes open for uh, further publicity. Spread the word around to your friends not to make arrangements anyplace else that night. And uh, we'll all have a good time. <coughs> All right, now i got to check my notes again, and I think I've covered everything. And I'll turn the uh, meeting over to Stan for the uh, main program. <coughs> to bring your attention, uh, what's in this book, this is the history of Yale University, uh, and uh, in this uh, page 247, it says, uh, there were no other notable scientists on the Yale faculty when Porter took office, one of the presidents, among them Elias Loomis, Chester Smith, Lyman Hubert, Anson Newton, and Addison Emery Barrow. Of this group, Barrow was by far the most important. He came to Yale in 1864 on the recommendation of Louis Agassiz, and was made a professor of zoology, but he had so few students that he taught physical and historical geology from 1870 to 1894. As Wesley Cole later remarked, and he could not have, uh, could not have said uh, the same of other Yale professors, it was unfortunate that so able an investigator was burdened with so much routine teaching. Nonetheless, he was according to the Dictionary of American Biography, one of the greatest systematic zoologists of America. And so we have here tonight Herb Adams, who is a native of Norway, uh, where he grew up not far from the actual Old Squires farm. Uh, some of you remember we had a program a little while ago on C.A. Stevens. He served as a state legislator from Parkside, the Parkside area of Portland, and now serves on the Portland School Board. He worked for the Guy Gat Communications Company and lives in Portland. Addison Emery Barrow was a Greenwood born boy who made very good. As the very first tenured professor of zoology, the word was coined for him, uh, at Yale in 1873, he taught at New Haven almost 50 years, discovering <coughs> over 1,000 new specimens of marine life. He was also the model for Cousin Addison and C.A. Stevens' Old Squire Stories in the Youth Companion, as the clever cousin who collects minerals, digs up meteorites, stuffs birds, and invents useful objects, all of which the real Addison also did in real life. Beryl was one of the of America's most famous scientific celebrities of the first quarter of our century. And so without further ado, we'll turn it over to Herb Adams, who's going to tell us, discuss <coughs> Adams, uh, 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 Beryl's uh, uh, impressions of his native town, uh, along with all, lots of other things, knowing Herb. So Herb, here you go. <laughs> So I was saying to Stan earlier, it's wonderful to be back in Bethel, and uh, not the least of reasons for which is to add for one night one more Democrat to the town. <laughs> a couple of days too late, but anyway. Um, Addison Verrill was one of the remarkable set of people who all came from this little corner of our part of Oxford County. It's something in the soil, I tell you. The, the person who saved the passenger pigeon and killed himself in doing so, Charles Otis Whitman, the remarkable C.A. Stevens, who you've heard about uh, many times in the stories you perhaps have read, Addison Emery Barrow, whose life we'll be discussing today, his brothers and sisters in the family, all remarkable people, poets, artists, writers, scientists, all who came from this same little patch of very fertile soil. Some of you may well remember reading the Youth's Companion magazine when you were young. It doesn't mean necessarily that you were old enough to have subscribed when you were young, because the magazine ceased publication in 1929. But they were saved, they were bundled, they were kept in countless piles and countless attics. I remember seeing them as a boy. There were things you just didn't throw away. There were always plenty of them. And there still are. And it was uh, one of the most long-lasting family magazines in its own lifetime, from the 1820s to the 1920s, and had one of the longest sets of, you might say, influence upon families after it ceased publication, because of the strong memories that people had of it from their childhood, and the fact that they would pass it on to their grandchildren to read. 
the co copies are very durable. I'm holding one here that was exactly 100 years old, August 18, 1898. The copy is still in wonderful shape. I realize every Oxford County Republican home has a picture of William McKinley in it, so I know this is not a surprise to you. But likewise, here, this one is from June 28, 1923, near the end of the run. C.A. Stevens appears in the front story, is the author of the front story here, and indeed he's the author of the front story in this one, that had appeared over a quarter century before. C.A. Stevens wrote for this magazine for over 60 years. It's hard to find a similar long run by a single author in a single similar publication anywhere in the history of American literature. For our purpose tonight, we're speaking of his farm stories because most of us who remembered the old squire's farm stories and read about them in our childhood and in our adulthood would remember as one of our favorite cousins, Cousin Addison, who uh, is the good boy of the farm stories. He's the cousin who calls his grandparents sir and ma'am. He invents clever little devices that save labor or are scientifically interesting. He stuffs birds, he collects minerals, he makes his own blowpipe to do experiments over the alcohol lamps. His room is full of stuffed birds, wasps, nests, uh, shellac and varnished. All of the sort of things that a kid would love to do, and which when I was a kid, you still did in Norway, Maine. Uh, this is why, if you read about him, you identified with him, because you know you did this stuff, and he was a real person to you. I literally collected all that stuff. I mean, my collection of bird's nests, I had a wonderful collection of bird's nests, which I kept in boxes underneath my bed, with, which my mother, who's here tonight, would periodically evict from me. Boxes became a little too alive with other uh, assorted things, much to my everlasting agony, and I have to go out and collect them all again. You did that sort of thing, which is exactly what he did. You thought of him as a real person. As I grew up and was able to discover by reading that, in fact, uh, the stories themselves of the old farm, as you've heard in the discussion of C.A. Stevens, where, whereas they are authentic, they are fiction. Um, the cousins didn't gather around one table at the end of the Civil War. There was no single person who was the old squire and grandmother Ruth. The cousins were real people, but they never lived together. And yet their story life is as real, because it hits you right here, as any real life that they led. Much the case in the case of Addison Verrill, a remarkable person who came literally off the hillsides of Greenwood. And when I say literally and hillside, we mean it because Larry Glatz and I, uh, just about a year ago, the 18th of October, 1997, literally climbed one of those stony hillsides to find the birthplace of Addison Verrill, where our story begins. His life was as remarkable as the fiction life which he led. He was born on the 9th of February, 1839, literally in the hills of Greenwood, his father was George Washington Verrill, great Yankee name. His mother was Lucy Hilborn Verrill. He was the second son of the family and the third child. It is possible from his own memoirs that we know he was born in the farmhouse which once stood atop a cellar hole that had previously supported a blockhouse built upon the mountain frontier of Greenwood, Maine in 1782 or so. Don't forget the, the great uh, last Indian attack in uh, New England history, in Maine history, happening here in Bethel just a year or two before. So clearly it's possible that the blockhouse that he had heard about as a boy was indeed built there for the very reasons. We stood there in front of that cellar hole on the 18th of October, 1997. It must have been a very cold winter spot to be born that February. Open fields and mountain valleys that would tunnel the Canadian Express straight down over the crest of that hill, sweeping down the Greenwood Mountains. Addison, in his old age, wrote that perhaps six farmhouses with their warm yellow window lights could be seen from the barrels of an evening. Of course, today it's heavily overgrown, and it take considerable imagination to imagine what once was the farmland that we were standing upon. I thought of that, standing there alone in the autumn leaves uh, a year ago. No lights now. 
But what was familiar to the boy growing up just uphill from his grandfather, Addison Verrill, who lived just up the hill from his grandfather, you could still find. It was very much like C.A. Stevens' own view of the world, again, living just up the hill from his own grandfather. <coughs> Brings us to the two lives of the real Addison Verrill. We all know about the cousin Addison, who was one indeed of the favorite cousins that C.A. Stevens gathered in fiction around their grandparents' table, the old squire's table, in the spring of 1865. <coughs> in point of fact, at that exact time, in real life, Professor Addison Verrill, in the spring of 1865, was a uh, full uh, professor of zoology at Yale. He was the actual person for whom the term zoologist was coined. Previous to this, he had been a natural scientist. Addison was the first tenured zoologist at Yale. But although there are two actual different lives going on in fiction and in real life at that time, the two lives are very, very parallel. As we have described, Addison is the good boy of the farm story. He's a bit of a goody two-shoes, in fact. But he's always a red-blooded worker on the farm. Uh, he has uh, two jobs, in a way. He farms all day, and he studies half the night. And the real Addison was like that, too. Later, we'll look at the similarities between Addison's boyhood memories of his uh, life in Greenwood and the stories of boyhood that C.A. Stevens wrote. Uh, they had actually and obviously very much of a shared childhood. Addison lived his boyhood just across the town line from C.A. Stevens, who was born and lived in Norway. Addison is not far in miles, only about a mile, but across the Greenwood town line. So they went to different schools. Uh, Addison uh, actually went to a school that was known locally as the Shagadee District of uh, Greenwood. In fiction, uh, C.A. Stevens calls this the Baghdad District of, uh, of uh, the schools. And, uh, of course, his district in Baghdad have terrible fights, throw hornet's nests down the chimneys, you know, in each other's schools, and do these sort of things. I think, as we've read, uh, as you'll see from uh, Addison, these things actually probably did happen in one way or another. Addison, uh, as a boy of 13, we know from his own accounts, had already made his own alcohol lamps, his own lead blowpipes. He collected minerals. He stuffed birds using arsenic. He had collected over 1,000 samples of plants in the Greenwood, Norway era. That year, when he was 13, 1853, Addison's father, George Washington Verrill, a storekeeper, moved uh, from Greenwood to the town of Norway with his family. And Addison went to the Norway Liberal Institute, which was actually a private school that had started in 1847. Stood in the vicinity of the Second Congregational Church in Norway today. He went there from 1853 to 1859. It became Norway High School in 1856. The current Oxford Hills High School was its lineal descendant. Addison's own brother, Byron D. Verrill, was its principal during those years, 1856 to 1859. Those of you who have read the C.A. Stevens stories may remember the beloved school teacher, Master Joel Pearson. We think this may actually be Byron Verrill, who as a young man was C.A. Stevens' school teacher. We know that Addison was a very bright student, taught astronomy to other students. He was an early photographer in Norway. We have several pictures there of the town taken from the high aspect of Pikes Hill that we believe are his work as a young man. George Washington Verrill, his father, often needed a son to help in the store at all times. So George Washington <coughs> Verrill's three eldest sons took turns at work and turns at school. So Addison's time at the Norway Liberal Institute had to be supplemented with home study. Still, Addison's own son remembered that his father, our Addison, somehow had gathered in that Norway Liberal Institute enough knowledge to speak Latin and Greek. He could read French and German before he went to Harvard in May of 1859, when he was barely 20 years old. Now, Addison actually went to the Lawrence Scientific School a division of Harvard, and found himself there in remarkable company. Addison's uh, boyhood friends from Maine accompanied him to the Lawrence Scientific School. Edward S. Morse of Portland was one example, who kept a very careful and colorful diary of his time in Harvard. And we have many wonderful glimpses into the life of the undergrads in those days. 
Now, the reason I'm not quoting to you from Addison's diary, which he kept, is because his sons donated that diary to Harvard in the 1960s, and it immediately got lost. Oh. No one knows where it is today. It's somewhere in the vast stacks down there. Yeah. Morse and Beryl roomed together, so we do have a glimpse of what was going on with them. We know that Addison, thanks to what Morse wrote, Addison Beryl arrived on the train from Norway, Maine, to go to school at Harvard with a box of snakes and two live owls. Oh. <laughs> I saw you jump. You like snakes. I don't think of a box of snakes you want to move into a room with, right? <laughs> this was one of 30 birds, alive and dead, with which they would share their, pardon me, 300 different birds, alive and dead, oh, with which they shared their small quarters for the next three years. Should I leave the part about snakes out? He had a lot to do with snakes. <laughs> All right. And they, the, the snakes kept getting more numerous, too. Some real, some uh, in bottles. Addison would have gone down upon his first arrival at Harvard into a ramshackle wooden building that was next door to a brick basement where they were furiously building and setting up scaffolding going up by the banks of the Charles River. This would be the first Harvard Museum of Comparative Zoology. Addison was in its predecessor, a long, low wooden building down into which he would have gone into a cellar smelling of alcohol, lit by lamps, no electricity there yet, and would have met Louis Agassiz. Mm -hmm. Louis Agassiz, though forgotten today, was sort of, and it is not too much to say, he was the General MacArthur and the Carl Sagan rolled into one of his time. A great, famous individual, like the General, had much of the General's personality, but like Carl Sagan, the late great astronomer, he was a great explainer of science, had a remarkable personality, highly attractive, at the same time that he was highly difficult. Louis Agassiz was the greatest American scientist of his time. He's still famous among American scientists and zoologists for the way he taught people and the students that he taught and sent out into the world. We have to explain who he was, though, because time has passed and we've forgotten him now. Agassiz was Swiss, Swiss-born. He was 50 years old when Addison met him. He was short, he was stocky, he had a big nose, and he chain-smoked big cigars. His fingernails were permanently burned <coughs> yellow, and his fingertips were permanently burned brown by contact with chemicals day in and day out. He was a great friend of Oliver Wendell Holmes, James Russell Lowell, the poet. Longfellow wrote a poem in honor of Agassiz's 50th birthday. Agassiz was short-tempered, highly opinionated, and he spoke with an incredibly thick Swiss-O-American accent, which we know exactly what it sounds like because Morse told us. Huh? As a young student sitting watching <laughs> Professor Agassiz interrupt a lecture at the Boston Society of Natural History. After a long and tedious harangue by the person at the podium, he got up, Agassiz shot to his feet and says, This is not the place for such papers, and if such papers are read before the society, will lead to unfortunate results. None are able to discuss the question that such papers should be sent to astronomical society. This is a society of natural history as the books in the shelves show. And that's it. The whole, the whole story is written in dialect like that. Now you can imagine what it was like studying with such a man. He was one of the greatest teachers of his time. A student approaching him down this dank cellar stairway. Remember, he's down there puffing on a big cigar alcohol lamps burning to give what light there was, foul-smelling chemicals out of which he reaches in and pulls out things to hand to the students. He would, this is how he taught, Stan Howe, a young student, comes in and presents himself to Professor Louis Agassiz. Agassiz said to one student, one we should use Stan as an example, he would reach into this foul concoction and pull out a dead fish and give it to the young student his first experience of knowing why his fingertips and fingernails were going to be discolored all his life in the profession of zoology, say, look at your fish. And the student would go away for two days and look at that fish and learn what there was to learn about that fish. Bring it back. The professor would hear what the student had noticed about the fish, and he would be told he had seen nothing. Look at your fish. So the student would take it home for another two days. Remember now, this is four days for the dead fish. <laughs> Study it again. Figure out scale. Go, 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 go. See if this teeth are shot and go back and 
Again, Agassi would say, you have seen nothing. Look at your fish and send him home with it again. Now you've had a week with a dead fish. You're going to learn or you're not going to learn. You're going to be a zoologist or a naturalist or you're not. And if you stuck with it that long, then Louis Agassi knew he had a student, had a scientist, not someone who's just some rich boy, rich man's son, come to school. <laughs> Addison, fortunately, when he went in, got assigned a goose to study, not a fish. He got assigned a dead goose to study. He probably seen more than his share of geese on the farm at home, but he studied that goose for weeks, and he was still amazed at what Agassiz could make on a long list of things that young Addison had overlooked. But Addison was hooked. Addison was going to be a scientist. Addison's classmates, all pupils of the great Louis Agassiz, made up one of the most important classes ever to attend Harvard. They were all remarkable people. Edward Sylvester Morse, who came from Portland, Maine, went on to Shinagawa, Japan. There, he stumbled over the Omori shell heaps, and digging through them, looking for clam shells and different strata, as he had done on the coast of Maine, he began to find pottery. And for the first time, it was made clear to the Japanese by a Westerner that they had an incredibly ancient tradition of pottery making in civilization that went back longer than they knew as the layers descended. He was the father of Japanese archaeology. He is still a beloved name in Japan, completely forgotten in our own country. But Portland is now a sister city of Shinagawa, Japan, because the Japanese, 100 years after Morse first went there, came back and said, you know, this is a great man and we wish to do honor to you because he has honored us. Hmm. Dear personal friend, of Addison Verrill. Another classmate, Nathaniel Southgate Shaler, who died in 1906, of Kentucky, <coughs> where he was later dean of the Lawrence Scientific School at Harvard. He was Theodore Roosevelt's geology teacher at Harvard, one of the great scientific explainers of his day, an after-dinner speaker, talk about comets and fish like all of that. A remarkable man, sadly again forgotten now, Frederick Ward Putnam, 1839 to 1915, born in Salem, later president of the Boston Society of Natural History, and the first curator at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, when such museums were young and first built, and these are the first young men who make the science come alive. The great Alpheus Hyatt, 1838-1902, was born a merchant's son in Baltimore, but grew up to later teach paleontology at MIT, the first paleontologist when the science emerges. All of these were new sciences. All of these were their first professional practitioners. And all of these young students coming into uh, to Agassiz's presence had plenty to think about. Because in the year 1859, when Addison made that trip down the stairway, only a few months later is when Darwin's Origin of Species was published for the first time. A lightning bolt to the scientific world. We have to turn back to Agassiz for a minute. He was the inventor of the theory of glaciation. He believed that from the evidence on the rocks, remember he's Swiss, in Switzerland, that great massive sheets of ice had ground across the landscape from the north to the equator and from the south toward the equator in antiquity. As <laughs> New England was a special place where you could look at this. We have here, and of course I can't find it because I wish to hold it up for you, but as soon as I do, I have here his paper on glaciation in New England. Agassiz did not come to Oxford County that I can find, but he wrote these very interesting, he didn't write with an accent, he could write English very well, very fluidly, and he writes about his trips to at least to Lewiston and up the coast, and he did uh, correspond with Dr. Nathaniel Tuckerman True, of course, the great uh, naturalist and uh, master of everybody else's business and his own here in Bethel, you know, much of, of, of Louis Agassiz and Nathaniel Tuckerman True, a man interested in everything. Now, Addison had grown up uh, under the mountains here in Greenwood, where there was plenty of examples of glaciation and the lakes here, which are his legacies. Therefore, Addison became a favorite student of Agassiz because he saw instantly the proof, intuitively, of what Agassiz was proposing as what was considered a pretty outrageous theory at the time. However, brilliant as he was, and I should point out that Agassiz's equally brilliant wife, Elizabeth, went on to become the founder of Radcliffe College in later years. Remarkable family. Brilliant as Agassiz was, 
He did not believe in evolution. Agassiz believed that the world had been wiped out by a gigantic flood in the days of Noah. He believed that species ended, not because evolution uh, came to a disastrous end, as we believe today, but because God smote the earth with a flood and killed all things. A scientist in those days could hold what we consider two opposite ideas in their mind at the same time. And Agassiz argued both of these ideas, glaciation, good theory, the theory of the flood. He was a del I have to struggle to say the word, a del delusionist. Or so. well, he was, a, he was a, uh, maybe he was antediluvian himself, but he believed in, indeed in the flood. He argued vociferously against the points brought up in, uh, in our, the origin of species and puts Addison and his fellow students in rather a bit of a difficulty because Addison and his fellow students with their eyes wide open were soon to be surrounded with evidence all about it, all around them, as we shall see. When they moved out of the old wooden hall into the new Harvard Museum of Comparative Zoology, Addison and his roommate, Morse, took up residence in the old building, which was known as Zoological Hall, or the zoo for short. All the students lived there. Uh, we have, uh, we do know, for example, that Addison liked to bring bees in nests home from Maine during Christmas vacation and put them in the hallway as it was constantly annoying Morse because on warm winter days, you know, the bees would wake up because of the fires and all come out and buzz around in the hallways. <laughs> Plants and things that Addison would bring back would sprout in the heat of the room. It must have been quite a place. <laughs> Addison also had the lifelong ability to fall asleep anywhere. And we have this wonderful story from uh, Morse's own diary of what Addison Verrill was like. Addison could fall asleep at any time on anything. And when he fell into a deep sleep, Morse would get up and rearrange the furniture as a joke. So here's Addison. Beryl has a habit of laying down on the sofa and getting to sleep when it becomes late, and I have some fun with it, writes Morris in his diary. Our room is always in great disorder, as you may imagine, when I tell you that Beryl is a good deal like myself in those things. Well, as I was saying, Beryl gets to sleep, and when he wakes up, he's awful sleepy. So while he's asleep, I put the chairs, the tables, the boots, the spit box, the coal hod, and the shovel in such a way that he has to go over them in order to get to the bedroom. Then I take the lamp in the bedroom, open the door about an inch and yell for him to come to bed. Then I keep an eye and ear open for his execrations. He tumbles over one thing and says, gosh. Then he strikes his toes against something else and says, devil on it. And then he brings up against the coal hod and he says, damn. Then when his other expressions get more and more obscene and ludicrous enough, and his fizz, his face, when he gets into the bedroom is laughable. He looks sleepy and the light striking on his eyes causes them to close and his features distort in every shape by the pain and perplexity of his clumsiness. And I generally laugh myself into a fit of hiccups. And Beryl wants to know what the hell there is to laugh about that. <laughs> so you can see it was a lively time to be a student at Harvard in those wonderful days. <laughs> we do know that uh, Addison was sent by Agassiz to Washington, DC to uh, do work in the basement again, all these poor students spending their lives in the basement of what was uh, today known as the Smithsonian Institution under its first director, or secretary as they called it, Joseph Henry, sorting corals and things like that. Addison, we know, did, however, take the opportunity here in the spring of 1860 to sightsee around Washington. We have some excerpts from his diary because Addison's son, before giving it to Harvard, which lost it, copied them out in a biographical memoir of his father. Addison here goes and visits the ruined Washington Monument, which is not yet finished, only 170 feet high. I went inside, writes Addison, and I was disgusted at the barbarity displayed by visitors who have not only completely covered the walls with their disgraceful names mm. and pencil marks and red chalks on the polished marble, but have even painted their names with black paint and cut them in with jackknives. I'd be ashamed of my country if so many of the names did not indicate a foreign origin, but I fear far too many are Americans. Um, Addison is no great fan of the Irish, is what you just, just heard there. Washington is a peculiar city in many respects, right, Addison? One peculiarity is that nobody you meet seems to have anything particular to do and is in no hurry to do it. He speaks of pigs running in the street. Um, 
horses uh, wandering at will throughout the dusty long avenue that was Pennsylvania Avenue. He goes to the inauguration of President Lincoln. We had a position very near the front, writes Addison. The procession arrived and Mr. Lincoln appeared with the other chief officers. Mrs. Lincoln was also visible. She is quite a pleasant and good looking woman. Mr. Lincoln is a much better looking man than I'd expected from his photograph. His side whiskers improve his looks very much. He delivered his inaugural address in a clear and distinct tone. It was heard and applauded by nearly all of the vast crowd assembled about him. Everybody seemed pleased with it. There were at least two Oxford County boys that we know of in the audience that day. Hannibal Hamlin getting sworn in as vice president, and Addison Emery Barrow, a student at Yale, standing down in front of the box looking up at these people. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that Addison went to the White House that night for a levee. I shook hands with Mr. Lincoln, who seemed very hard at work. I saw Mrs. Lincoln, who was quite small, very handsome. She looked very young, and I should think she is very pleasant. I also saw Stephen Douglas and his wife, who has the reputation of being the handsomest lady in Washington. She is quite large and much taller than the little giant. I finally got away more fortunate than many people, for much to my own surprise, I lost neither my overcoat nor my hat. <laughs> Agassiz sent his students on hands-on trips. And we know that shortly after leaving Washington, that Hyatt, Shaler, and Addison were sent to Trenton Point, Maine, by uh, Agassiz to investigate their shell heaps and to Mount Desert Island to uh, dredge up new marine invertebrates. Addison actually invented a rake-like device to do this, which is still used today and still known as a, as a barrel dredge. In 1861, Agassiz sent Ordway, Putnam, and Addison to Washington, D.C., again to sort more corals and birds' eggs. And this was remarkable for the young man who had never been south of Massachusetts except this one previous trip before. In the summer of 1861, we know that Hyatt and Shaler and Addison Verrill went to Anticosti Island, which is off the coast of Labrador, to collect fossils and plants and eggs on the schooner Inlet. And they stayed from June to September of 1861. We do know very much about this because C.A. Stevens, Addison's real cousin, apparently uses this voyage, among several others that Addison did, to write a fantastic series of extremely popular books using these remarkable travels as the uh, basis of adventures of these young boys, all of whom are, uh, are actual people, one of whom is actually Addison, under hidden names. This is called the Camping Out series that C.A. Stevens wrote up about 10 years later into books with remarkable titles, Left on Labrador, Off to the Geysers, uh, great books like that. I brought On the Amazons here, right? A remarkable book. And you can see uh, clearly done in high quality, beautiful end papers mm -hmm. of that. True books of quality. Now, we do not know if C.A. Stevens was actually with them on these voyages. He writes as if he was. And in some interviews at the end of his life, he claims he did. I can find no evidence, in fact, that he did, and I must give uh, Larry Black's credit, too, for his careful researches into this. I think C.A. was a very clever man who was an adaptive writer, to take vivid living memories from his beloved cousin and turn them into stories so real that you're convinced that the author was there himself. In point of fact, we can't find that he did go. But here again, the cousin Addison, who's called Addison in this, and Wash and Wade and other characters, who are actually uh, based on these real people, Shaler, Hyatt, and Addison himself, do live in those books and do real things that I think are based upon what Addison must have told him. Addison's own father, the storekeeper we left back in Norway, Maine, died in the summer of 1862. Addison's mother had died in November of 1861. She left behind a 15-year-old daughter and a young boy not yet 12. Addison had to arrange for the care of these young people. Don't forget, he's barely 21 or 22 himself at this point. His education, though, he did continue as best as he could. He went back to Eastport in 1863 to Grand Manan Island. And by 1862 and 63, had already published, as a young man not yet 25, at least 22 serious scientific papers, 15 of them on invertebrates, three on corals and polyps, one on plants, two on minerals, most of them published in the Proceedings of the Essex Institute of Salem. In 1862, he did a wonderful little book, paperback, booklet, called Birds of Norway, Maine, and Vicinity by Addison Emery Verrill, a rare little pamphlet. If 
you find it, make sure you pick it up. I've had the honor of holding a real one in my hand that he had annotated himself in later years. It's remarkable to just take short glimpses in it to see what a different world he lived in. Under the category of Haliatus leucocephalus, bald eagle, Addison dismisses the bald eagle in the Bethel, Norway, Greenwood, Oxford County area with three words, resident, common, breeze. So common, you didn't even have to make any comments about it. What a different world in which he lived. Addison graduated Harvard that year, 1862. So far as we know, he did try to enlist in the Civil War. And as his son wrote, he was, quote, unable to stand uh, marching in double time and other strenuous uh, exercises, unquote. In other words, we today would say Addison was found to be 4F. He did try to become a surgeon during the war, but the war ended uh, before he could actually enlist and finish his medical course. We do know that Addison liked fencing. He played the new game of baseball. He loved skating. He kept a large menagerie in his home, as we've talked about, of snakes, turtles, woodchucks, a live fox. This is all in the little room at Harvard. He never drank. He never played cards. He never smoked. Now, you can imagine how difficult it was for him down there with Agassiz puffing away in a big cigar, shouting in Swissified English, you know, reeking of, of alcohol and preservatives. Addison worked, however, with Agassiz after his graduation as Agassiz's assistant until 1864. Agassiz's influence in the uh, academic world was such, I forgot to tell you that uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson caught a glimpse of Agassiz once on a, on a trolley in Cambridge and said he looked like a cheap but successful politician. I'll give you an idea exactly. It tells you something about what uh, the vigor in the man's personality. Addison was suggested by Agassiz to be the first professor of what would be called zoological science at Yale in 1864. His appointment letter of acceptance, we have Larry Blatz to thank for requisitioning for the first time from the archives at Yale. And I'm holding it up to the first audience to ever see it. This is a very important document in the history of American scientists. This is the last naturalist. This is the first zoologist. This is his letter of acceptance, taking the position at Yale that he was to occupy for almost 50 years. Addison would stay from 1864, when he was 24 years old, just short of 25, to 1907, 43 years. He was curator of the zoological collections of the Peabody Museum at Yale from 1865 to 1910. He taught geology at Yale, as we've heard, from 1870 to 1894. Simultaneously, he was working for the United States Fish Commission. He was a curator of the Boston Society of Natural History for 10 years. He taught in his spare time at the University of Wisconsin as a professor of comparative anatomy from 1868 to 1870. And he was associate editor of the American Journal of Science from 1869 to 1920. Can you imagine that? Addison probably personally discovered and named 1,000 new species of life, mostly marine invertebrates. Corals, echinoderms, meaning the starfish, sea urchins, marine invertebrates like that. He directed the creation of the first life-size model of the giant squid for the Peabody Museum. He made three trips to Bermuda that we knew of, that we know of, and wrote three books about the zoology and the botany and the geology. We know for a fact that Addison had an encounter because of that with the great General Joshua Chamberlain. The American Association for the Advancement of Science, then an infant organization, held its national gathering in Portland, Maine in August 1873. During the same week that Joshua Chamberlain, who was then governor of Maine, uh, and uh, pardon me, just, uh, you know, he was still governor, uh, and uh, head of the Maine State Militia, had the first great militia muster since the end of the Civil War. The parade down Congress Street in Portland was enormous, so huge that while the scientists are all gathered, and this is according to the Portland transcript, um, because I, I've lost my place, excuse me, uh, I'll have to paraphrase until I'm able to find it. What happens is that uh, Morse, his friend, his college roommate, is at the board, 
expatiating on evolution, making fantastic drawings on the blackboard. Morse was ambidextrous. He could write with either hand, write Greek with one hand, Latin with the other at the same time. So he could talk to you while he was drawing at the same time on the blackboard. And as he's doing all this, discussing evolution, they hear the thunder of drums in the street, and the entire convention automatically votes to adjourn itself, to rush to the windows, just to see Joshua Chamberlain ride by on his great white horse, Charlemagne, followed by the main uh, troops of the militia. And the newspaper points out that not for the first time were academics scattered by the bold forces of the military as upon its approach. <laughs> we do know that uh, Addison would work through from one day to another. That is, he'd sleep at his desk in his chair, fully dressed. He would take a nap maybe from 8 to 9 p.m., then he'd get up and work to dawn and go straight to class. He never cared if his clothes were pressed or not. A lot of students who wrote about him in later years says he uh, looked like he slept in his clothes. Well, he did. They just didn't know that. He would often skip lunch. So he was an absent-minded professor. Sometimes he'd be two to four hours late to dinner. He'd work straight through dinner, even forget his own lectures, sometimes not even show up. Addison, we know from pictures that we have of him, even as a very young man, had very thick, wavy, white hair cut up, combed up in a coxcomb. We have one picture of him here. He had very blue eyes. He could describe from memory the details of all over 1,000 species that he had personally discovered and named. We know that in 1865, he married Flora Louise Smith, uh, the sister of Professor Sidney I. Smith, his old college friend of Yale, Addison's boyhood friend from Norway. Addison and his wife had six children. Addison didn't always sleep in his chair. Addison and his wife had six children. His great friend, Alpheus Hyatt, and Addison Verrill were such great friends, remember these are the two young men that went to Labrador together, that each of them named a son for the other. This gets complicated. Alpheus Hyatt and Addison Verrill so admired each other, each named a son for the other. So you have an Addison Verrill Hyatt and an Alpheus Hyatt Verrill, who we're going to take note of, who signed his name A. Hyatt Verrill, and was himself, much like his father, an ethnologist, an author, an illustrator, and a world traveler, a remarkable person. A. Hyatt Verrill, whose signature appears here, wrote over 100 books in his lifetime. He wrote probably too many books, because they show the strain of uh, quack composition. But the paintings are remarkable. Mm -hmm. A. Hyatt Verrill did this beautiful painting, which is, was no longer existing, part of a diorama at the American Museum of Natural History. A. Hyatt Verrill did these remarkable drawings of plants for strange insects and their stories. A short mm -hmm. sentence you can spin out into an entire thick book. A. Hyatt Verrill was a remarkable illustrator, and in fact, his father and the son often worked together. Addison wrote the definitions of all zoological terms for the 1890 uh, uh, Webster's Dictionary, and his son, A. Hyatt Verrill, illustrated them all. Addison was also the first scientist who probably described, though he didn't know what it was, what you and I today know as a giant squid, and he did so from a big mass of something that washed ashore in Florida in December 1896. Addison writes this up in the American Naturalist for April 1897. This is actually it was a big glob of multi-ton something that took a six-horse team and tackle to turn over. This was drawn from a photograph. And if you look very closely, you see the person that drew it down here is A. Hyatt Verrill, Addison's own son. Addison is actually the first scientist to describe, though he does not know what it is, what today you and I would know to be a giant squid. He wrote a lot for the popular press like this because uh, he knew that this is one way of putting science into the hands of individuals. Addison's wife, Flora, died in 1915, just before the wedding of uh, their daughter, who was married in Norway, Maine, to an artist named V. Akers in a uh, wonderful building that no longer stands across the street from the Norway Public Library. A wonderful uh, 
wedding it was, probably the biggest gathering of literary and scientific greats in Norway history. Uh, C.A. Stevens and his wife was there, Madame Scalar. I'll show you, uh, we just had some pictures printed. Here's Madame, and no one else has seen these yet. Here's Madame in her opera finery in Europe doing Tannhauser, I believe. Sure, that would be about three years before uh, this wedding of which we're speaking. Um, Don C. Seitz was there. Don Seitz was the son of Reverend Seitz, J.A. Seitz of the Universalist Church in Norway, Maine. Uh, Don Seitz, written biography of Artemis Ward, you may have read. He's the only real uh, pioneer in that field. It's difficult to even trace uh, where he got some of his literature then. He was the uh, assistant manager of the New York World, Joseph Pulitzer's newspaper, and wrote the best biography of Joseph Pulitzer that still exists. I brought this to show you because by dumb luck I picked it up, and by golly, it's autographed by John C. Seitz. A remarkable man who's worthy of an evening here someday himself. Uh, an author who was always very interested in, in Norway, Harrison affairs. It's he who convinced the town of Norway to pave its main street. A uh, remarkable uh, set of uh, stellar people, all there at that one time in 1915. Mylon Bennett, who was C.A. Stevens' uh, helper, and indeed the person who uh, maintained the laboratory for C.A. Stevens, the laboratory being Stevens' enormous uh, and complex mansion that stood at Norway Lake. Here's a picture of it taken by my grandmother, Lillian Frost, in the year 1941. My grandmother went around and took all the pictures she could of Norway Lake Village to give to my father, who was away in the war. And of course, looking back on it now, I'm close to, hard to believe, 60 years ago, to see all these wonderful buildings in their original form. Mylan took care of this place for C.A. Stevens. We do know that in 1915, Mylan uh, snapped a picture of Addison Barrow on the lawn of this building with a little girl, it's Addison, a Mylan's little daughter who died young. But he looks just like you'd expect him to as a professor. He's wearing a black swallowtail coat, stripy trousers, big white mustache, uh, thick white hair. And there he is. That summer, and the summer before, Addison, I think looking backward a little bit now, because his wife had just passed on, sat down and wrote a uh, beautiful reminiscence of his boyhood in a series of newspaper articles, which we have here. It's called Norway, uh, pardon me, Greenwood in the 40s, or Recollections of the Early Settlers of Greenwood, Maine by Addison Barrow, Professor Emeritus of Yale University. It appeared between 1914 and 1915 in the Oxford County Advertiser today, the Advertiser Democrat of Norway. It's a wonderful series of articles reminiscing about the boyhood that he had known in Greenwood. These are interesting because you think the generation that came of age to have memory in the 1840s was the last generation to know uh, the back country before the coming of the railroad. In Addison's own boyhood, where the railroad went and where it didn't, either made or broke a town. Greenwood did not get the railroad. It broke the town of Greenwood. Addison's father moves to Norway. And in Norway, Addison goes to the Liberal Institute, becomes a photographer because of his education, goes on to Yale. Addison was the sort of man who realized that that little difference, where the railroad went and didn't, had made all the difference in his life. Mm -hmm. This is the generation that grew up to fight in the Civil War, as Addison tried to. They were the last American gen uh, generation, at least in the back country, to have known life as it had been fairly much since the Revolutionary War, before the coming of the Industrial Revolution. So you find a lot of memoirs of people who wrote about Norway in the 1840s, Greenwood in the 1840s. Addison was at great careful length to write out his boyhood adventures, which I believe, and uh, Mr. Glass has been so careful as to footnote, became the later fodder for the C.A. Stevens' old squire stories. Addison would write about a real thing he'd done. C.A. would read it in the Northern Norway Advertiser and create a fictitious event around it to fit in the old squire series. C.A. Stevens, who's also a child of this period of time, born in 1844, had at this point started to write the beautiful series of old squire stories in full elaborate flower for the Youth's Companion, the magazine that I showed you earlier. C.A. had uh, likewise been through a cycle of life and death. That is, his first wife, 
whose uh, marriage was not compatible, his own second cousin. They were perhaps too much alike, and C.A. was simply away too much to make a good marriage. When he would come home sometimes dressed in a Mexican serape and a hat from a visit, we know that his daughters would scream and run away from him because they didn't know who he was in this outrageous outfit. Kind of sad. His wife died in the great laboratory, uh, actually the building across the street from it, in 1911. He marries Madame Scalar and has a second life which he devotes uh, you know, to loving her deeply, she was the love of his life, and to turning backward in memory and writing about the farm stories in which Cousin Addison becomes one of the most beloved and large figures. Cousin Addison was well aware of what he had become on paper I asked Mylon Bennett, who had known Addison, the real Addison Verrill, if Addison was aware of his other life on the page. Mm -hmm. Mylon Bennett assured me, yes, he had. He was quite proud of it. It's remarkable for me to think now, here I am a little kid visiting Mylon Bennett and talking to him, that I knew someone who knew Addison Verrill, who was born in the year 1839. <laughs> and I'm sure that indeed this is part of the whole story that he meant and he appreciated. C.A. Stevens came up against the same wall that Addison did, and that is age, which comes for us all. Addison dealt with it with ever the scientist's mind by going into, if you read very carefully his reminiscences of Greenwood in the 1840s, you'll find that Addison, with his scientist's eye, not only takes a great deal of pleasure in writing about the people he loved and the strange local characters he knew, but tracing different things like white hair and blue eyes, which he had, through his family. Genetics was not an understood science, and it didn't even have a name at the time. But it was clear that somehow these things were passed on. Addison, with complete dispassionateness, analyzes the prevalence of club-footedness in his own family, which passes down through seven generations in his own writing. Through the introduction of club-footedness, though he doesn't know how, remember the word gene doesn't exist, uh, through the lowering family, lowering, it's still continues to this day in citizens of Norway, who shall remain nameless, uh, because they are related to the Verrills and the Loverings. It came down through them. Addison looks upon his own relatives as dispassionately as he does the scientific world. C.A. Stevens uh, had attempted, as you have already been told, to spend a lot of his old age uh, writing beautiful stories of his boyhood at the same time that he was trying to prolong immortal life. As you've already been told, C.A. Stevens literally believed literally believed that if Henry Ford could make an assembly line to produce cars, then assembling enough scientists of the right minds and supplying them with enough uh, materiel, they could discover what germ it was that invaded your body and made you get old. And by eliminating that germ, you could live forever. He believed that with the proper things being done, people could live to 120 right then. Bang. The generation of the 1840s would live to be 120. Think about that. We would have known them all if it had worked. They, wouldn't have, they would have still been walking around in the 1960s. The scientists who were supposed to come to the laboratory were going to be housed in a series of monk-like little rooms up along here in this section of the laboratory. Um, they never came. World War I came instead. And the great dream of conquering death and cracking its secrets didn't happen for C.A. Stevens. So in the pages of the Youth's Companion, and collected in these wonderful little books, Haps and Mishaps of the Old Farm, this was given away as a premium if you subscribe to the Youth's Companion. Or this beautiful book, When Life Was Young at the Old Far Squire's Farm in Maine, in which incidentally appears a picture of a boy who C.A. Stevens says is Addison when about 18. We don't really know if this is him or not. It's difficult to reconcile it to the real pictures we know of the older man. But nevertheless, here he appears, in which uh, C.A. Stevens uh, makes all of these wonderful cousins, you know, uh, better, purer, uh, you know, not caricatures, and indeed, but more than people uh, ever really could be uh, in his uh, beloved memory of these people. Addison Verrill lived to know that this was being done to him. I wonder if you read all of these C.A. Stevens books. C.A. Stevens wrote a wonderful book called A Wildwood Romance, the story of Addison, the great popular cousin, in which Addison goes north to Labrador and falls in love there with a young woman. It's a Victorian romance, almost a Gothic romance. She dies young. 
Addison never marries. He is left there in a uh, little gazebo built by the sea where she passed away, I think of tuberculosis, if I'm not mistaken, forever dreaming of her memory and finding comfort in this wild place of crashing waves and, and crying gulls. Then he brings Addison to another end, also in the pages of The Youth's Companion. If you read the old squire's stories, you'll be happy to know that they never really end. The old squire and grandmother Ruth age into their 90s, but they do not die. There is no story talking about their passing. They are eternal in that way. Addison Verrill goes away, becomes a great success. Cousin Halstead goes away, the bad little boy, you know, the guy's got mixed Spanish blood, so he has night sweats and kicks in his sleep and lies and steals, you know. It's not a pure blood like Yankee blood, you know. C.A. was a Yankee through and through. Halstead goes away, reforms, and come back. Beloved cousin Theodora and Ellen go away, marry, have children, come back. And Addison uh, himself does come back, too. There's an interesting story, which is reprinted in a book that Larry was an associate editor of, called The Young Birds Come Back, about a Thanksgiving dinner at some indefinite time, we assume perhaps in the 1890s, where all the young folks get together on their own, decide to go back to the old farm to surprise the squire and grandmother Ruth without telling them that they're coming. And they sneak up to the windows in the November snow and look in and see the old couple bent alone over a small meal or a few tallow candles because they are lonely and they don't wish to, to uh, have the memories of the family uh, at Thanksgiving all come back to them. And of course, there's cousins burst in on them and it's a great happy reunion and all of that. Now, Addison must have read all of this in his own time. He doesn't leave us his reaction to it, which is a little bit interesting, unless it exists in letters we have not yet found. And that does disappoint me, because a man of such sensitivity and thought as he might have had something very interesting to say about it. As it was, what he leaves us is his reminiscences of the long ago, which laid down next to C.A. Stevens's, you can see where many of the stories came from, and how two men extremely gifted, dealt with growing old into that point in the 20th century. Sadly, uh, Addison's great friend, Morris, dies in 1924. Addison himself passed on in 1926. He was hale and hearty to the very end in his 80s. Uh, he had, in fact, gone out to his other son's uh, uh, major, uh, George E. Barrow, who was a uh, civil engineer for the United States Army Corps of Engineers, gone out to spend the winter with him in California, taking with him his unfinished tomes about the geology and botany and uh, marine life of Bermuda. And there dies, very suddenly, hale and hearty to the very end. C.A. Stevens of the cous cousin circle dies in 1931, and cousin Theodora, the last of them all, dies very sad and blind and living with her daughter, alone in the city of Brooklyn, for goodness sake. 1935, all that noise and hot breaks, imagine that. But that is where the last of their circle of living people who were the real cousins on the farm pass away. Addison's work was continued <coughs> by his remarkable son, Alpheus Hyatt Verrill. Here is Addison Verrill's um, obituary from the New York Times. As you can see here, he was a pioneer in biology, he says. I wrote many of books on zoology. He was the last of the great scientists who were responsible for the great development of the Sheffield Scientific School. His entire life was marked by zealousness and scientific work, which was almost unsurpassable, which was often carried on a great detriment to himself. He was indefatigable in his researches. He goes on to point out that of the American generation that founded the sciences you and I know and take for granted, Addison was among the very last of them to go. Addison's life, as the obituary points out, covered what was then considered the first half century of American science, from the 1840s to the death of his generation. He was the last naturalist. He was the first zoologist. And it's hard to believe that in the lifetime of one single man, the entire scheme of uh, what we come to know about American science was created. Addison's son, A. Hyatt Verrill, a remarkable man in his own right, lived until 1954. His, here is his obituary from the New York Times. A. Hyatt Moore Verrill, explorer, dies at 83, 
wrote 105 books on history and travel. To show you how the world had changed, he dies on the same day, and his obituary appears just below the obituary for the great actor, Lionel Barrymore. So you can see, I mean, not only from the birth of photography, created a couple of years after Addison was born, Addison being a young still photographer himself, his son dies in the great era of the great film stars. And in two lives, in that respect, you have the entire stretch of uh, American science. Addison does have living descendants today. He has one or two granddaughters still living out in California. Addison lives also in the book which he wrote, which thanks to the Bethel Historical Society, which allowed us to copy the original articles here uh, last year, we are now in the process of annotating and correcting and uh, putting into form, which will be coupled with a biography of Addison and printed, we hope, in the year 1999. Uh, the last year of the 20th century, uh, to celebrate the, the work and the life of Addison Barrow, who helped create the 20th century that you and I know. I hope he would be pleased at that thought, and I think he would be definitely pleased to know that we were doing it up here in the hills of Oxford County, where he came from, where his whole story started, and where, with good luck, we will continue it, uh, and at this time next year, we'll be able to walk back there and pick up a book about him along with the other books we have about C.A. Stevens and the others. That was a long life to talk about in a short time. But I'll be very glad to take any questions if you have any quickly. I know the sugar cookies are calling in. <laughs> questions. Can you believe it? Think of all those good logs that were on the fire when I started gassing. And looked down the hills down. <laughs> yes, Stan. Uh, uh, John E. Gould, a close friend of uh, uh, Edward uh, Mentioned this whole sort of this Moss. Todd Moss, yes. Correct. Uh, they went to Gould together, Edward Moss and uh, John E. Gould went to Gould together, Gould Academy together. And there's a lot of in John E. Gould's diary of Edward Moss, too. So that is, and Stan is correct. Uh, Stan, of course, uh, being the, the man of the, uh, of the town, knows that uh, there is a direct connection between that whole uh, cadre of young men and Bethel because of the, the John Mead Gould uh, uh, connection. John Mead Gould's great-grandson, Nicholas Noyes, of the Maine Historical Society, has kindly given us permission to copy Addison Verrill's original manuscript, which was lost for years. Uh, we went hunting for it in the vaults. It was finally found. For the first time in about 60 years, I was holding in my own hands the actual manuscript with Addison's dinky little minute, you could tell he was used to writing on microscope slides, printing in which he'd annotated and written out these own articles. We will have quite a bit more to add into his book because of things he, he wrote in there. You must remember when he was writing in 1914 and 15, he tells a little story in his microscopic handwriting that didn't make it into the newspaper articles, but we will put it into the book. He was walking down the beach one day with his grandfather, Verrill, and he picked up a uh, sea urchin and asked his grandfather what it was. His grandfather said, quote, that's a whore's egg, quote, unquote. <laughs> Madison says, what's a whore's egg, grandfather? And grandfather says, that's a wild seabird. <laughs> and now, obviously, Addison in 1914 would never have printed that. I understand there's going to be a, a black a rectangle go over my eyes on television just telling the story here. But they, it will be in our book. And believe I went down to the waterfront and asked one of my friends who harvests uh, sea urchins. I picked one out and said, got a nickname for this? He says, Jose. What's the matter with you? It's still used. <laughs> You know, little things like that make Addison come right back to life, you know. It was a privilege to know anybody that knew him as I did. But, you know, he's not that far away from us. You know, he was a man very much of his time and helped invent our time. And it's a great privilege to kind of know him in that way. Um, other questions? If not, I know the sugar cookies are singing now. <laughs> Thank you very much. I've enjoyed it.